everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. We are 100% sponsor based, which means that all the revenues we derive come from sponsorships. But I try to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically trying to choose those who have values well aligned to the values expressed on this show, like freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do is a few ad reads right here at the top of the show and then a few ad, ad reads in the middle. And I hope you won't skip them. I hope you'll take the time, listen and see what they have to offer, because again, these are hand selected sponsors. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Swan Private. Swan Private is a concierge financial services firm based in Los Angeles. Now, I've known the Swan team for years, and these guys are laser focused on the Bitcoin mission. They even have a zero tolerance policy for all shitcoining. Recently, their CEO, Corey Clipston, was instrumental in calling out many of these crypto scams right before they collapsed, saving a lot of people a lot of money in the process. Swan Private focuses on guiding high net worth individuals and businesses on all aspects of Bitcoin strategy, including buying, custodying, and market research. This concierge service provides you direct access to a private advisor by text, phone, or email. So go to swanprivate.com slash breedlove today to sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Ledin. Ledin lets you do more with your digital assets. For instance, Ledin offers a B2X loan product that lets you leverage your existing Bitcoin to buy even more Bitcoin. Or you can also get traditional Bitcoin collateralized US dollar loans through Ledin as well. Ledin also offers both Bitcoin and USDC denominated savings accounts, letting you generate yield on your digital assets. Recently, Ledin has launched a Bitcoin mortgage product as well that lets you use Bitcoin to buy a home or finance one that you already own. So go to Ledin.io, that's L-E-D-N.io today to sign up. Hey everybody, welcome to the Sailor Series book release Twitter space. Uh, this is actually the first Twitter space I've ever hosted, so thank you for joining us. And we have our esteemed guest, Mr. Mr. Michael Saylor, who just joined. Hey, thanks for having me, Mike. Robert. Thanks for joining us, Michael. And so we, as many of you may know, uh, Saylor and I recorded a long series together, um, 17 episodes in total, which was the inaugural um, series for my, my show, The What Is Money Show. We released this, started releasing this in late 2020 on both YouTube and the podcast feed. Um, I think the total content comes to about 25 hours across the 17 episodes. And today, um, and more recently, we've released a book, which is uh, basically a transcript of our conversation with some summary bullet points at the end of each chapter. And today, we're going to kind of go through a highlight reel uh, of that conversation and the book itself, uh, which is now available on Amazon. And I think just for starters, um, I'd like to say that the, the feedback from this series has been overwhelming. Um, it, you know, I was walking through my neighborhood in, in Nashville, Tennessee, about a week ago, and some guy in his 60s that was cutting his grass, you know, stops the lawnmower and like runs across the street and introduces himself and was, you know, thanking me profusely for, for this particular series. So... Um, it's been a bit strange to see how far the reach has been, um, given that, you know, my, my initial question to Michael was just, you know, what is money? Let's, let's talk about it for a long time and, and see where it goes. And so I personally was very excited that people have found this thing valuable and, uh, the reach and longevity of it has, has been quite impressive as well. Um, Michael, I wonder if you've had any particular feedback or comments you'd like to share uh, from our conversation? Yeah, my thought was, um, I never really thought much about uh, what is money until you asked me. And uh, then we sat down for this podcast. I thought it'd be a couple of hours and it, it turned out to be like 18 hours or something like that. And then we eventually did 25 hours. 
And um, everything we did in those sessions uh, was pretty much based upon an outline that I just quickly reeled off in the first hour. I just created an outline of, of a bunch of things I wanted to cover. And then, and then the rest is just extemporaneous. So it's kind of interesting what comes out extempore. And when I looked at the transcript or this, this uh, book you put together is 400 pages long. And I thought that's a lot of words, (laughs) a lot of words. But um, a fascinating subject, right? What, what is money? Um, the highest form of energy that humans can channel, right? Money is energy. A monetary system is an energy system. And as soon as you start thinking about money as an energy system, if you're an engineer, the next thing that pops up is you start thinking about, about um, every other energy system, hydraulic energy systems, water, electricity, thermodynamic energy systems, mechanical energy systems, uh, and the like. And there are so many lessons to learn from all those other energy systems that, um, that uh, just, just as um, starting with the observation that money is energy and a monetary system is an energy transfer system to move energy through time and space and or uh, to vibrate energy on a given frequency or to program energy, redirect energy. Once you get that idea, right, you think about pulley systems and you know, and what a pulley system allows one person to haul a, a weight which is 10x more than they could pick up without that pulley system. So mechanical advantage and block and tackle and leverage. And, uh, and then, you know, what are the techniques for redirecting energy? I'm going to pull down, but I want, uh, I want the energy vector uh, to move in, out from me, right? How do I do that? Um, that's that's a, a subject that engineers deal with all the time, right? Mechanical engineers, civil engineers, nuclear engineers, aeronautical engineers, ocean engineers. They're always dealing with energy and materials, and they study it with a great deal of discipline and there are right and wrong answers, right? There are mathematics matters and there are laws of physics and, and you can't cheat. Um, you know, there's always the, you know, the laws of thermodynamics, right? You, you know, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. You can only transform uh, it, uh, transform the nature of it. And, and once you uh, accept that, right, you realize that the, I mean, the number one rule of thermodynamics is you can't cheat. Right? You just cannot cheat. And uh, engineers know this, and they design all their systems with that in mind. There's no shortcuts. There is no such thing as a free lunch, as Heinlein would say in his books. Um, and every aeronautical engineer knows you want the plane to go further, then you're going to have to give up some payload, or you're going to have to change the material. And you want it to, to go faster, then you're going to give up you know, some degree of safety and making it go faster. So engineers live in this world, but um, economists don't. And money has traditionally been the province of economists, or at least in our modern world, economists and politicians. You know, we have, we have lawyers in charge of the money supply. You know, economists, lawyers, politicians are considered to be qualified to run the monetary system, the bank, you know, the banking system, the money system and the money supply. But if you actually just accepted the idea that money is energy and a monetary system is an energy network, then you would actually think that I ought to put an engineer in charge of that. And um, Bitcoin's the first time when anybody figured out how to engineer a monetary system. And Satoshi is, a, is an engineer, right? I mean, a, a multifaceted engineer that had a 
pretty good familiarity, not just with economics and politics, but had a good familiarity with mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and computer science and cybernetic systems and servo mechanisms and stability and feedback. And, you know, for first order stability is something that you that you absolutely have to understand if you're an aeronautical engineer. When you design an airplane, if it's stable, it means when the plane tilts 10 degrees to the left, the, um, the lift on the wing builds up to bring the airplane back to center. And if it's stable, it'll tend to fly true and, and upright. And if it's unstable, when it tilts 10 degrees to the left, it'll tend to tilt 20 degrees more to the left, and then it'll just flip and go into a, a spiral, a death spiral, and crash into the ground, you'll die. And so lack of stability uh, typically means the plane crashes and burns. And in, uh, in ocean engineering, when you build a ship, you want stability so that when the ship, you know, pitches, you know, 10 degrees to, the, to one side, it tends to want to come back to, you know, to stability, to a, to a neutral point, stable point. Uh, and if it does that, right, then it's going to not capsize. <laughs> But if it's unstable, the you know if you get the center of gravity too high, uh, or the center of mass too high in the ship, it, it, you know you tilt twenty degrees to the left or, or, or something like that, you get a roll, uh, and the, the thing just rolls over. So, um, not not engineering systems with stability is a death sentence in the engineering world, but uh, in the monetary world not getting the stability right is a political inconvenience and you just kick the can down the road and leave it to the next person. And ultimately, the result is the monetary system collapses. But if it takes 10 or 20 or 30 years, you're not there and you can just blame it on something else. So, so I think the question really um, had a big impact on me, as you can tell. And, and, um, and the result was whatever, 25 hours of content and <laughs> 400 pages of stuff and uh last i checked on youtube looks like we have 250,000 people viewed it so that was uh quite surprising yeah it's it's been uh quite tremendous and i i find it interesting that this is just a relatively simple question about something that we all use and think through every day takes you straight into the you know some of the most primordial substances we were talking about time and space and energy, feedback systems, et cetera. Um, and, I, you know, I, I really appreciated the framing. We were talking about Bitcoin moving us from politically run money to a appropriately engineered monetary system. And, you know, so the, the, I guess the central theme, if there is one of the Sailor series, is that, right? It's how human beings channel energy across space and time toward the achievement of their goals. And, you did a really good job starting in the beginning. I don't know how much more first principles we can get. You, you know, you started in the stone age and basically uh, built your thesis all the way into the digital age. And in terms of how humans have channeled energy historically, you initially focused on three technologies. You focused on fire as an energy technology. You focused on missiles and you focused on hydraulics, uh, as a means of channeling gravitational energy. Could you give us just like a, a brief overview of the significance of uh, fire missiles and hydraulics? Yeah, well, I mean, when I first started thinking about money as an energy system and, and money as a, as a economic, a socio-political economic form of energy, then it just led me to ask the question, what, what were the formative energy systems of the human race in the Paleolithic era? So I went back 100,000 years and I said, you know, what, what elevated humanity? And uh, it's not, not that hard, right? You know, it's like fire. We've got, we've got Prometheus in our mythology. And the whole point of fire is, is harnessing and channeling chemical energy. And uh, converting a log into heat or into light is a pretty good trick. And, and cooking food or pre-digesting food using a wooden log is another pretty good trick. And I was focused on that because it, it's, it's so intri 
intricately interrelated with our evolutionary biology. And there's so many people with the thesis that humanity would never have would never have um, emerged if we didn't actually master fire because we couldn't we couldn't uh, digest enough food and do it quick enough in order to divert energy to our brains. And so, you know, if you if you don't have fire, you know, you're a, a horse or something or a cow and you're just eating all day long, but you're never going to get that smart because so much of your energy is diverted to your digestive tract. So it doesn't take much much consideration to realize that without, you know, fire is a means of protection, a, me, a means of not freezing to death, a means of digestion, a means of signaling, a means of information uh, gathering and maintenance, you know, not to mention the fact that you, you don't just cook food, right? You, you cook terracotta clay or you cook materials, you can create construction materials, you, you can uh, work stones and and you can harden you know the tip of a spear right you can uh smoke food to preserve it right fire fire turns out to be pretty useful uh in so many different ways you can scare away something bigger than you that would otherwise eat you so it's it's um it's defensive it's offensive it's uh constructive uh it's useful and uh, you know that the missiles thing is just like you, you start thinking about converting a potential energy to kinetic energy, right? A, a bow. I draw the string of a bow back. I put an arrow in it and I send the arrow a hundred feet or 200 feet or a thousand feet or however long I'm going to fling it. And if not that, I do it with a sling. And, um, I, I think the, the the critical idea there is that it's just very difficult for us to rise above, you know, any creature that um, that has sharper fangs than us. And if if someone's got if someone's bigger or stronger or tougher than us, you have to stand off from a distance in order to beat them. So whoever masters missiles wins. It's got the, they've got the long reach. Not only can you actually stand back a hundred feet and blast something, but you can also stand up 30 feet on a cliff and blast them. So, so uh, it's a pretty good evolutionary trait to master the ability uh, to direct an energy weapon uh, in a distance. And it's pretty obvious today, right? I mean, someone's, someone's got a gun and you've got a knife, you're going to lose. And if they've got a rifle and you've got a pistol, you're going to lose. And if they've got artillery and you've got a rifle, you're going to lose. And Ultimately, someone that can drop something from 50,000 feet above you on your head is going to win. So missiles turn out to be uh, pretty critical to advance as well uh, of humanity over creatures. And then eventually the most sophisticated tribe that mastered the most sophisticated missiles dominates the less sophisticated tribe. And that's continued to this day with ICBMs and and uh, and even even the Star Wars initiative that we credit for toppling the Soviet Empire was was um, either mastering the ability to fling a missile or mastering the ability to knock a missile out of the sky that someone else fl flung at you. Uh, I mean, the last subject hydraulics really is just water power, right? I mean, water water is one of the most effective ways to channel gravitational energy and. You know, ancient peoples took water and uh, they created mills and they created machines and they and they um, did work. And, you know, if you um, if you have a waterfall and it'll do the work of 100 people, then, uh, you know, that could be pretty useful to you. Right. Especially if you're one person, <laughs> you get the mill working and you can relax while the water does the work. So. So I think the significance of all these is their early, their Paleolithic energy systems with a different purpose. And if you mastered them, you built a civilization. And if you didn't master them, the best case is you run around with the animals and you know better off than the chimpanzees. Or the worst case is you don't master them and the tribe that's adjacent to you masters them and they just murder you and you're done. Right. And, and uh, you get squeezed out of the entire ecosystem. So I, I, I think when we started to 
consider those. The, the big idea is the civilization that channels energy most effectively wins. And, uh, and, and I think that was kind of the theme for the rest of the entire series of podcasts. Yeah. Great elaboration there. I, and so the civilization that channels the most energy, the most intelligently wins, um, obviously these are primitive forms of energy, but they're very instrumental to building a civilization. But to your original answer to the question, like money would be the highest form of energy that a human can channel. Um, if then that energy network that we call money is monopolized as it has been throughout history, what is that doing to this highest capability that humans have where we can yeah, use money to coordinate the actions of one another. What is the, the monopolization? How is it actually disruptive to that energy network that we call money? You know, I mean, fundamentally, the difference between uh, monetary networks and, um, and sanitation, uh, you know, water networks or, or um, missile networks or, you know, f fire furnaces is, is that you can't cheat mother nature. So if you create a, um, if you create an aqueduct system and you put a leak in it, then eventually you, you get half as much water. And if the leak's enough, you get no water. And if you can't move the water, the city of 50,000 people has enough water for 5,000 people and 45,000 people die. And that's it. And the people figure out that the mayor of the town screwed up the aqueduct when they all can't drink anything and they die. Right. And the same is true. You screw up your furnace and it burns your house down or you screw up your furnace and the, and the fire goes out and you freeze to death. Right. No cheating on that. Right. It's, it's pretty obvious. And and it's not a political issue. Like nobody says it's not fair that the fire went out or it's not fair that the cistern didn't capture water. And they don't you know, when someone shoots you in the face with a missile or throws a, a bullet you know, at you from a sling and you're there bleeding. You know, no one says, you know, that's not fair, right? I mean, the truth is the lead bullet flies through the atmosphere and they either hit you or they don't. Um, so those are engineered systems controlled by the laws of physics. And they might be brutal, but you cannot cheat them. You, you cannot elect a new mayor that just passes a law that says the bullets don't work anymore and use that to save yourself from the enemy coming over the ridge. The uh, money is different. Money is socio-political energy. And so when it works perfectly, it is economic energy. But when it is captured by a political, uh, a political organization or centralized, and when it is corrupted, it becomes imperfect energy. And, uh, and so if we look at at, uh, at money through history, right? We've got Lydian coins and, you know, we write about them, but, but you know, the, the, the history that you read is 10,000 incidences of one people conquer another people. They sack their city, they lay siege to their city, they kill all the people and they take all the money, they melt down all the old coins and they recap and they recoin new coins. So, you know, it's the Spartans fighting with the Athenians, fighting with the Lydians, fighting with the Persians, fighting with the, you know, fill in the blank, the Romans and the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians. And and uh, they've all got their own system of coinage. And you can literally find thousands and thousands of them. They all have gold in them. Gener generally, what happens is you start out, you know, you start out as a as a young virtuous people, the Romans. You're young and you're hungry, and you conquer the Etruscans. You take all their gold, you take all their property, you build your own coinage, and then um, and, and that coinage is high gold content traditionally, if if it was on a gold standard, and then you use that uh, to build a free economy, and the economy has trade, and people create ships, and they create wagon wheels, and they create buildings and they create weapons and they hire mercenaries or they pay soldiers and then you defend yourself and over time uh you expand as long as uh the as long as the society is not corrupt 
uh, when the political system is not corrupted, when the monetary system is not corrupted and everybody feels it's fair and equitable, that's an incentive for people to fight to defend their home because they because they appreciate it and they love it. And it's an incentive for business people to work hard because they know they'll be fairly rewarded. So the uh, the city or the city state grows and it keeps expanding until eventually the son or the grandson or the or the thirteenth successor to the virtuous king takes over, gets lazy, debases the money, cuts the amount of gold in the coinage by thirty percent and then by fifty percent, and as they cut the and debase the currency, people start to lose faith in the ruler and lose faith in the economic system, and then they start to cheat. And or, you know, people don't want to defend it. And eventually the mercenaries want to be paid more. And so, you know, taxes have to go up and the coinage has to get debased. And eventually people lose faith in the entire system. And along comes a younger, hungrier, more virtuous uh, group of people that aren't so fat, dumb and happy. And uh, and they conquer the older, fat, dumb and happy, corrupt civilization uh, the history book uh, written by the loser is something like these evil barbarians came and they and they took our stuff for no reason whatsoever. And isn't that unfortunate? But the history eventually gets rewritten by the winners if they stick around long enough to be, you know, the the civilization that failed was corrupted. The, the Romans said the Carthaginians were corrupt, you know. And um, so the winner rewrites the history book. And they just take all the the corrupted uh, property and all the defective systems and they either destroy them or melt them down and reform them. And the cycle begins anew. And that's why the gold that was in the Lydian coins probably made it into Persian coins, Athenian coins, Roman coins, you know, Venetian coins, Flor Florentine coins, Spanish coins. British coins, you know, all through history, we just keep going through this um, rise and fall. And I think the, the big idea here is I can't corrupt um, an aqueduct. And I you cannot create a corrupt airplane. You fly a corrupted airplane. Like, you know, Howard Hughes imposed his will on the spruce goose building a plane too big of materials not strong enough with a propulsion system not powerful enough. And it flew for whatever, 20 seconds or 30, you know, 30 seconds and it didn't fly anymore. It's, it doesn't matter how rich you are or how egotistical you are or, or how bad you want it. It just won't fly if you cheat the laws of physics. And in, uh, in money, well, it'll fly and you can do irrational things if you have raw power for a period of time. Uh, I mean, Nero could act like Nero for about four years and eventually the economy collapsed and he got murdered, you know, and Caligula did the same thing. So in the extreme cases, you can be literally, you know, crazy, you know, nuts and suspend the laws of everything for uh, anywhere from a number of months to a number of years. But eventually... The economy collapses, the society collapses, people lose faith in you. You know, over the midterm, typically 10 to 20 years will do you in. You know, Zimbabwe has been getting driven driven into the ground for about 40 or 50 years. I mean, you can't do it for 100 years without everybody dying or getting murdered or um, or collapsing the society. But but you can you can certainly uh, corrupt a monetary system with uh, political meddling, you know, over some number of years, I guess, when you get a strong enough leader, they aren't, they normally crash their money supply in about 20 years. And if you're lucky, you know, if you're the world reserve currency or the world leader, maybe you'll last 100, 200 years before you crash the system. And uh, I think the lesson to be learned there is, is, uh, engineering integrity, you know, having physical integrity, linking your system to the physics of the real world is the safest thing to do because all, all governments eventually are corrupted. All corporations are corrupted. You know, any, any 
system run by mankind will eventually be corrupted, if not in the first generation, then, then the second or the third or the fourth generation. And, and it is really inevitable. It's, a, it's almost impossible to avoid because, you know, you've got that meme, you know, like hard times make strong men and strong men make good times and good times make easy or soft men and soft men make hard times, right? It's like, it's very difficult if you've been successful to make sure that your grandchildren are equally motivated, you know, and Genghis Khan learned this and Alexander the Great learned this and the Romans learned this eventually, you know, or Lord Acton said, right, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so too much of anything eventually corrupts you. And uh, nature has a way of solving the problem, right? This you don't see any fat predators and i look at all the beautiful birds and i think they're all beautiful and they're all and they're all very energetic and chirpy and happy and they fly why is it that there are no corrupt fat dumb happy birds and the answer is because they don't last more than 48 hours in nature when they get fat dumb and happy right nature pretty much will it'll squeeze everything that is not you know, operating at, at, at peak performance out of the ecosystem, every, every last vestige of it is gone. So it's continually cleansing itself from irrationality or, um, or sloth. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you could almost say leakage. Oh, leakage just destroys energy networks. And for human systems, this corruption is equivalent to leakage. Um, you know, inflation obviously is clearly a leak of purchasing power, clearly corrupt. And it destroys civilization over time or eventually because you can't cheat nature, as you're saying. So maybe you can cheat it for some period of time because it's a sociopolitical system. But eventually um, the you know proverbial bill comes due. And this whole process of leakage or corruption is really contradictory to the central tendency of nature, which is energy conservation or, you know, to follow the most energy efficient strategy, something we talked a lot about in the series. And, um, you know, I, that, that helps clarify the importance of Bitcoin, but we've, we've seen this happen time and time again, as you've said, right. The, the compromising of the monetary protocol, through corruption or leakage, leading to the collapse of other protocols, ultimately the political protocols, uh, in many other eras of history, like ancient Rome. Um, are, are we seeing that today? Are we experiencing that today? I mean, clearly the monetary protocol is being compromised. It seems like the world is, is falling apart in a number of ways. Do you think we are uh, going through one of those historic breakdowns today? Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> And I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. Wasabi lets you use Bitcoin privately while still maintaining full control over your money. Specifically, Wasabi Wallet is an open source, non-custodial wallet with privacy built in by default. By using Wasabi, you're effectively putting the private back in private property. Wasabi Wallet is an easy-to-use privacy wallet that can support any amount of Bitcoin transactions. So, go to wasabiwallet.io today to download this state-of-the-art wallet software. 
Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Pacific Bitcoin Conference, brought to you by Swan. Now this is going to be a two-day event in Los Angeles, November 10th and 11th, 2022. And if you haven't been to a Bitcoin conference yet, I highly recommend it as there really is no better way to get integrated into the Bitcoin community. Speakers announced so far include Michael Saylor, Lynn Alden, uh, many others. I'll be speaking as well. Uh, Michael Saylor is even quoted as saying, this is going to be the event of the year, so you definitely don't want to miss it. Uh, so go to PacificBitcoin.com and use discount code BREEDLOVE to get your tickets today. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This is going to be a three-day event held May 18th through 20th, 2023 in Miami, Florida. This is going to be the biggest Bitcoin event of the year, and the past two years in Miami have been simply amazing. Speakers already announced for 2023 include Michael Saylor, Alex Gladstein, Corey Clipston, and many others. Last year, we did a 10 million sats giveaway specifically for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference slash 2023 and use discount code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Masterworks. Masterworks gives you access to the fine art market at more affordable price points. They do this by offering you fractional shares in their $500 million portfolio of fine art. Now, fine art is an alternative asset class, and historically, it's been a great performer and a really good hedge against inflation. Most investors typically hold anywhere from 2 to 10% of their assets in an asset like fine art. To sign up or learn more, go to masterworks.com and use promo code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CASA. CASA makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, CASA provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, Saifedean did some good research on it. And and before 2020, the U.S. was expanding the money supply by 7%. So we had 7% a year leakage annually. So we we're basically leaking half the energy out of the system every 10 years on the world reserve currency from since 1971. Uh, certainly, and I think probably since 1914 or so. So that's about a, that's about a seven percent leakage per year. But it was about a fourteen percent leakage per year in the in the developing world. So you know the money uh, energy has a half life, or money has a half life of ten years in uh, strong currencies, and has a half life of five years in the weak currencies. And that was the status quo till 2020. And, and the way that kind of reflects itself is in weak nations, the currency collapses about every 20, 25 years. And we saw currency collapses, uh, financial collapses in Russia. Well, there was one in 96. We saw currency collapses in Argentina about every 20, 25 years. So weak countries in Africa, weak countries in South America, weak countries in Asia, they keep losing their, their currency system collapses every 20 to 30 years. And then the strong currency, it's going to last about uh, 100 years or 50 years or so, 50 to 100 years. That all got accelerated in March of 2020 when I think the, the, uh, the rate of monetary inflation in the U.S. dollar, it doubled to triple. You know, it sort of went somewhere in the range of 20 percent a year. 15 to 20 percent a year. I think we I think we expanded the money supply 20 percent each of the next two years, and so a 40 percent debasement of the currency and the world reserve currency over 24 months. But um, if we look at the other um, currencies and uh, what's going on with them, I think it's um, it's kind of even uh, more disturbing. I mean, if you look at 
currencies against the dollar in the last 12 months. The Japanese yen is down 23%. The Polish zloty is down almost 19%. South African rand is down 17%. Great British pound is down 16%. Won's down 15 The euro is down 15 And uh, even the Chinese currency, which they control, is down about 8% year over year. So what we see is that uh, the strongest currency, the dollar, is losing something at this point like 15% or more of its purchasing power a year. Like, how do I know that? Well, what, the CPI and the PPI in dollars are clocking about 8.5% right now to 9%, but CPI and PPI are, are manipulated, distorted metrics of, an, of true monetary inflation because we cherry pick a subset of products and services and we choose to measure them in a, in a managed fashion. So uh, a reasonable conclusion is they certainly understate the extent of monetary inflation probably by, they probably understate it by half. You know, scarce desirable assets aren't included. Uh, we know American single family homes are up 40% in 24 months and yet the inflation would indicate that they should only be up 12% or something. So. So overall, the fiat currency system is uh, is bleeding energy at a more rapid rate. At a at a fifteen you know percent monetary inflation rate, money has a half life of less than five years, four years. And uh, you know, money in gold. If you had a perfect gold standard and gold inflates at two percent a year, money has a half life of thirty five years. So the best you could get to is a half-life of 35 years. And in a, and in a free market economy that's growing at 2% a year in real terms, if you're on a perfect gold standard and money has a half-life of 35 years, you'll get price stability because the money will lose 2% of its value a year, but the supply of goods and services will increase by 2% a year, and they offset each other. So that's the, uh, that's the uh, ideal golden age gold standard with uh, an economy with minimal meddling. Now, if you have an economy with tons of public policy, if you have foreign policy, medical policy, trade policies, energy policies, you know, work labor policies, education policies, communication policies uh, that all interfere with the free market, then of course, the supply of goods and services is dramatically decreased versus the theoretical output of a free market without all those policies. And then if you combine that with a, a monetary policy that expands the money supply by 40%, right, you're going to get extreme inflation in certain areas. The way you, um, and of course, in, in areas, what well, you really got is three tiers. I think in the world, you've got uh, the U.S. the U.S. economy and the U.S. currency, which is the strongest. It's the world reserve currency. You've got Europe and Poland and our allies and Korea and Japan, and they're weaker. They're kind of pegged to us, but they're but they're losing ten to twenty percent of their value against our currency. And you've got the the third tier developing world currencies like the peso and the Turkish lira. And of course, they're collapsing at 50% a year or more. And uh, what you see is, uh, of course, chaos in Lebanon. You see chaos in Sri Lanka, where the government will literally collapse. Or, you know, in Lebanon, right? People like someone holding hostages in a bank in order to get their own money back, which is sad, a sad meme for the time. Um, but I think all of this is indicative of the structural problem with fiat or political currency and political money. Um, and it's gotten you know worse, right? So uh, uh, however bad it was from 1971, it's almost like you could, you could divide periods, right? 1870 to 1914, gold standard, maybe reasonably stable, not perfect. If it was perfect, it would have been a Bitcoin standard in those years, and then the money would have gained 2 or 3% value every year instead of just holding constant. But, it, I mean, it was uh, the, closest approxi the closest mechanical approximation. It's like a mechanical watch versus a digital watch. The digital watch is always more accurate, but, but really good mechanical watches are pretty good, plus or minus a few seconds. So we had a good mechanical solution. 
um, you know, in that time period. Then I think we went to the gold reserve standard from 18, 1914 to, you know, Bretton Woods, uh, you know, based upon the Treaty of Genoa. And there the money started losing more of its, uh, of its uh, value. And we saw crises like the Depression that came out of it and eventually World War II. And then Bretton Woods moved us to a um, more of a gold reserve standard, but with the U.S. as the only counterparty and all the gold in Fort Knox. And I think then we started inflating the currency certainly faster, right? We, we had a faux gold reserve standard, but, but I don't think we observed it. And, and, uh, and we were definitely growing the money supply faster than 2% a year, I think probably. I, I think most likely 7% a year on average. And then you get to, you know, Nixon abandoning the gold standard and, uh, and it just tracked on at 7% or more. And uh, then we got to 2020 where we kind of threw out all sorts of rules and we just doubled, maybe tripled triple the uh, monetary inflation rate in the U.S. and maybe, you know, so stomped down on it for about two years. And I think that now, 2022, right, we're just going through this massive, massive uh, uh, transition where I think politicians realize that inflating the money supply by 20% a year in the Western world was not sustainable, I think they figured that out, and that's why interest rates are being taken up, and and we're squeezing back, and that's why you have all these risk assets trading off and and the like. But but what's the conclusion? The conclusion is we've agreed that we're not going to inflate the money supply by 21 percent, but we're probably going to inflate it by 14 percent a year. There's no way we're going back to seven percent a year inflation. So I think we probably land where we thought we would land, somewhere in the range of double for the next four years or something like that, maybe 14% in, in the US, but other currencies are worse, right? In Japan, they're trying to peg the 10 years to 25 basis points, and that's why their currency is collapsing against the dollar. I don't, the, the story is not you know finished here. We'll see how it turns out, but, but bottom line is, Everybody for the last 30 years knew that the U.S. dollar was not a store of value over the long term, and they all kind of went to indexes like the S&P index, and we used equities as a store of value, or we used real estate property as a store of value. I think looking at the next 20 years, I think people realize that in an environment where the monetary inflation rate is clocking at 15% a year, equities don't look like such a great store of value anymore because they're running on cash flows. And so now you got you got to think about what is your property store of value and are you going to use real estate and if so where are you going to put that real estate or are you going to use something like bitcoin as your store of value. And uh the the collapse you know there's that phrase, you know, you can if you're going to boil a frog, you kind of want to crank up the temperature slowly. I uh, you can it turns out you can boil people at 7% a year if you tell them it's 2% a year. And most people will grit their teeth and they'll fight through it. Only the really sensitive, sophisticated ones will realize that they're being boiled at 7% a year instead of 2% a year. I mean, I, I didn't realize it, Robert, you know, from 2010 to 2020, it didn't occur to me that the real monetary inflation rate was 7%. I thought, you know, I, I bought the political line as like 2% or whatever. And I just, you know, blame myself. You know, uh, I said, I just got to work harder. What's wrong with me? And then, uh, but the thing is, when you crank up the inflation rate to 25% or 20% in 12 months, it's, it's a lot more difficult to ignore it. So at that point, a lot more people get sensitized. Not everybody, maybe one or 2% were sensitized from 2010 to 2020. But and then maybe we got to 5% sensitized or 10% sensitized from 2020 to 2022. And now we're kind of on this education mission to sensitize the rest of the world with, you know, with the observation that, you know, look, Ayn Rand said 50 years ago, 60 years ago, she said, my mission is to separate the economy from the state. 
right? And so the ideologues understood it then, right? The Milton Friedmans of the world understood it, right? And and there are there's a Chicago School of Economics that campaigned for it, and and von Mises and and Frederick Hayek, right? But you know they didn't have a technology to solve the problem, so. This was a, a, a philosophy, and your only method to address this was politics. It was, it was a problem that had to be solved in the political realm. If you could get yourself appointed to be head of the Fed, or if you could become president of the United States, you know, then maybe, or, or, or be Paul Volcker, maybe you could take some, some action which represented sound money and, uh, and, and natural thermodynamically sound engineering principles. Maybe, maybe you could, but you had to be a politician. It wasn't until Satoshi gave us Bitcoin that you actually had a technology that was viral that you could build into a mobile phone or you could build into a website that may, might actually help you attack this or, or address this issue. So I, you know, I say Bitcoin is hope. I think, I think we always had the problem. We had the problem 10,000 years ago. We had the problem under the Lydians that, you know, we say, oh, yeah, they got conquered by a superior people. Well, uh, here's a different interpretation. You know, they became corrupt and they were conquered by uh, as yet uncorrupted people at an earlier stage in their life cycle before that people got corrupted. So, so you've got the rise and fall of empires over and over and over again. I think Von, von Schliemann found like when he found ancient Troy and he dug it up, he found 19 other ancient Troys underneath the one that he dug up. So people have been building and tearing down and building and tearing down and building and tearing down and building and tearing down, right? Thousands and thousands and thousands of years. This is the human condition, right? We could, Because we, you know, it makes you think. Well, we had to build our houses of clay and it was inevitable that they would get knocked down by a storm and we had to keep rebuilding. How many times do you have to rebuild a house made of wood in the past 10,000 years on the same spot, right? A lot. The problem is not the human, uh, the human aspiration. Humans have always wanted to build a beautiful house on a hill. The problem is you build the house on a hill with wood and it rots. And after 50 or 100 years, it gets knocked down or blown down. You got to do it again and you got to do it again. You got to do it again. So the lack of a material with integrity uh, that allows you to achieve that ideal has been uh, the human tragedy. After Bitcoin, we now have a material. Now, if you combine the ideology with the material and you build it into a business uh, or build it into a, a political system. You can build it into a currency. You can build it into a company. You can build it into a product or service. You can build it into a family. You can build it into a security, right? You can build it into something and you can, you can then take advantage of the superior structure and integrity of Bitcoin in order to achieve something, which is how much better if gold's got a half-life of 35 years and a fiat currency run well, has got a half-life of 10 years, and a fiat currency run poorly has got a half-life of five years, well, Bitcoin's got a half-life of forever, right? It's not not 100, not 2,000, not 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 years. So what if I told you, build a house with wood, it'll last 35 years. And then I said, oh, or by the way, here's this new new uh, material that will last a thousand years, build a house with that, the entire society would presumably be a lot richer because you wouldn't have to keep rebuilding the city every hundred years or every 50 years, right? Maintenance cost deteriorates, right? Stuff doesn't break. And then you can uh, redirect the access to human flourishing and progress. Beautifully said. Um you know, this whole perspective that you've given the world on money as energy really shows how closely I think we mirror our systems. Um, so we could uh, maybe perhaps modify Lord Acton's phrase to say that corrupt money corrupts absolutely. And, you know, the faster the leakage, the corruption or the inflation takes hold, the faster the system will fail. 
right? This is, it's one thing that we've seen just repeatedly. And, um, and I guess the opposite of leakage or corruption for a monetary protocol would be standardization, right? That, like a standard that, that binds everyone universally is almost by definition an incorruptible standard. Um, you know, a, a universal restriction, something like thermodynamics or gravity, you know, rules that we all have to play within. And we talked about this a little bit in the series that there are major Darwinian or competitive advantages that a society can unlock through standardization uh, of protocols. And, you know, focusing on money, gold gave us a proxy for a standardized protocol, as you said, you know, about 2% per year, but still that was obviously far from ideal. And gold standard never really worked either because it was always, it always ended up becoming corrupted by the political apparatus built on top of it. So how do you view the potential benefits of a global standardization onto an incorruptible money like Bitcoin? Like what type of gains do you expect humanity to unlock uh, as a result of this transition? Well, I, mean, I think that uh, there's just a, a multi-trillion dollar a year bleed or you know, something like trillions or, or 10 trillion dollars of inefficiency in the economy every year because uh, the monetary system is broken, the unit account is broken. And uh, so you know, what do I expect? I, I expect economic output would double, right? I, I, it's, um, if, if, you, if you've ever run a company, um, what you realize is the challenge in a company is to build systems that emulate gravity. Like the, the beauty of gravity is there are 8 billion people on the planet and, and up is up for everybody and down is down. And if the person actually drops something, the thing that they drop immediately goes down, driven by the force of gravity, the gravitational constants. They're all the same. They're, they're not political. There's no appeal. No lawyers get into it. It doesn't take six months to determine which way the thing that you drop should fall. It doesn't take a uh, hundred lawyers to determine whether it should stop falling, right? Because gravity is universal and a, I mean, there is a universal constant, I can then uh, build a house and build an elevator and build a car and, you know, I can be a gymnast and there's right and wrong and I can be punished and, you know, stuff happens. And you don't have to send a memo to 8 billion people to tell them how to walk across a room or how to jump up and down or how to play basketball or tell the ball how to bounce. It just works. In companies, you don't have that situation. So you oftentimes, when you're CEO, you're scratching your head saying, how do I encourage all 2,000 people to do the right thing? If a customer calls and they're unhappy, how do I encourage 2,000 people to do the right thing without you know, asking their bosses, 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 boss, what to do. You know, um, how, how do I make sure that um, nature, that the naturally healthy phenomena occurs? Water runs downhill. You don't got to tell water which way to go, right? Um, and so in companies, you spend a lot of time building systems, standard systems to tell people how to behave. And you hope to build it into the the reflex DNA of the of the company so that it's healthy, but it's really difficult. And I think in a civilization, it's the same thing, or a, a nation or a city. How, how do you actually build an economy so that everyone does the right thing for everybody else, rationally, naturally, without being told? And uh, and this the standard protocol, if it's decentralized, gravity is the decentralized protocol. So is friction. But you know. Uh, Language and math kind of are in a way, right? I mean, there's a certain math and it works. You know, anybody can add up two plus two and equal four. And if you say two plus two equals five and you try to tell that to your brother and you cheat your brother, he punches you in the face and you learn that maybe two plus two doesn't equal five, you know, and if you cheat in a business deal by bending math, you know, you get punished. And if you try to cheat nature by pretending that you've actually got you know, four pulleys up there and there's really only three, you know, and the system doesn't work, then you kind of get feedback. 
So we have these systems, physics, math, language, like the English language is good. I can tell you, well, Robert, I really like you. And, uh, you know, the words mean something to you and they mean something to me. But if I actually decided unilaterally to say, Robert, I really hate you, but I redefined the word hate to be the word like, but I was the only guy that did it, you would look at me strange and not want to interact with me because you still think like means like and you think hate means the opposite of like. So I don't get to redefine the English protocol, even if I wish I could. You know, even, you know, it's like the emperor has no clothes. Being rich or powerful doesn't mean that you can re, uh, rewrite your own language. Uh, you will delaminate from the civilization. So, so money, you know, the key to money is you want a standard protocol. And, and if you have a defective one, like, like you think anything's getting done in Zimbabwe right now? Right. When, when, you know, when you've got a currency that's collapsing in the Weimar Republic. Right. Uh, in that case, people are so worried about what happens next week that they don't have time to think a year in advance, much less a decade in advance or 100 years in advance. So uh, so a standard system that is incorruptible, that is uh, diffuse everywhere is is reasonably speaking, I, I don't see how you come to conclusion that the economy doesn't run at 50% efficiency with the current monetary system or less. Like we're certainly running in second gear, not fourth gear. And you can make arguments that uh, the economy runs at 10% efficiency. Again, coming back to my, my point, like if I actually denied you the ability to use steel and glass in New York City, like, could you build it? Like, what did it look like? If you go back and you look at, um, you look at all the islands in the Mediterranean, you know, the island has 50,000 people on it today, but in ancient times it had 5,000 people because that's how much water falls on the island. So what happens if I take away your sophisticated energy system? Oh, well, 90% of the people die. Is there any way around it? No, no way around it at all. Right. So I think uh, the energy system is critical. I guess the other organic metaphor is, um, you know, is uh, blood and bleeding for an athlete. And uh, what we know is if you want to be a top performing athlete and you want to run, win your triathlons, or your Ironmans or whatever it might be, you're just run at top performance. You can't afford to be bleeding yourself. It takes a month to recover from giving a pint of blood. So maybe you can give a little bit of blood once every few months. But that's about the most you can do. If I bleed you every week, your athletic performance is, deteriora is deteriorated uh, all the time. If I bleed you every day, I'd probably kill you. Right? If I bleed you fast enough. So what's, what's, the, what's the cost of losing 20% of your energy a year and how does that compound and at what point does it cause system collapse right it's like elementary triage right uh, the most famous phrase in medicine stop the bleeding well for, you know first make sure you're breathing then stop the bleeding and then deal with the problem and uh, money monetary inflation is bleeding and uh, the society is bleeding. It's always been bleeding, you know, always. And uh, it's bled worse or better at different times. But I, I would say right now we're in a pretty, uh, pretty difficult situation where it's not reasonable to think that the economy is going to advance. In fact, in fact, the bigger idea here is is the way we measure inflation is defective. CPI is not inflation because it is a distorted metric. But the way we measure economic output is also distorted. Like the GDP, uh, the nominal size of the economy is distorted. If I cut the number of airline flights in half, but I double the price of a ticket or I increase the price of a ticket by 110%, I can represent to you that the airline industry is 10% larger measured in dollars. 
But of course, it's half as large measured in actual flights or, or passenger miles. And so the real economy has been in, in recession, compression. It, it's probably shrunk 10, 20 percent a year for the past two years. But we tell ourselves that the economy is slightly growing. You know, in, in all those years where we grew the money supply 7% and the economy grew 3%, what was really happening here? Think about it hard. The real economy is not growing. And portions, you know, the, the availability of goods and services and the, and the delivery time and the convenience of those services is deteriorating, even though we can construct a nominal metric to tell ourselves that the economy is growing. So, so that's the long way to answer the question. The summary is the economy is crippled because the money is defective. And, you know, when, when Bitcoin is 10x bigger or 100x bigger than it is now, 80% of the economy will be crippled with 80% defective money. So we're going to have a crippled worldwide economy for a long time. And if you're wondering, you know, where the signs of that are, well, just look at across the entire world. Look at what's going on in Sri Lanka. Look at the problem in China when they blow up the 30, you know, the 30 apartment buildings that are empty. Look at the problems we have in South America. Look at the slums. Look at the urban blight. Look at the crime. Right, we have it all around us, and these are all just signs of uh, of corrupt, defective energy systems that, that uh, just don't work. Brilliantly said, uh, Mike. I want to be respectful of your time. Do you have time for one more question? Yeah, sure. Let's do one more. Okay, so what I'm hearing you saying is, you know, Bitcoin in many ways is like the first true level playing field we've ever really had. I mean, besides something like gravity, thermodynamics, et cetera, the first man-made level playing field, let's say, meaning that, you know, it's, it's rules that bind us universally. They cannot be corrupted. They cannot be broken. Um, maybe English is a close proxy for this, like an open. That's script. what I'm thinking, right? I mean, everybody can learn English and, and yeah. you use the words, I love you anywhere in the world. They mean the same thing. And maybe the system slightly evolves or corrupts over time, but it's it's a decentralized evolution that's fair and equitable to everybody. And uh, and just on the periphery, we sometimes we invent new words and we fight over whether we like the words or not, right? Yes, yes. And yeah, so it works, right? And even though it undergoes attacks, you know, certain politicians and whatnot, maybe it maybe try to attack language and change meanings at times. But Arabic Bitcoin, math is better, right? Like the meaning of the word one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Yeah. Right. I mean, and that's been pretty stable and decentralized for a thousand years or something. Yeah. Unless you're a postmodernist and two plus two does not equal four. Um, but Bitcoin is, seems to be a language of value that's entirely beyond corruption because you just can't argue with whatever's on that ledger just is, right? You own it, it, it happened. So yeah, a very important way to look at it there. And I, so the, the question I'm gonna ask you here is, you know, you concluded our original nine episodes together. Uh, we're focusing the discussion on the intervention of human beings into dynamic systems like the natural economy. And you concluded that, uh, it was episode nine by saying that We've been trying to turn nature into a zoo, and it was kind of a haunting ending in a way. And um, it certainly seems like the construction of that zoo has started to accelerate recently. How do we free ourselves from this? How do we present, prevent ourselves from uh, becoming zoo animals, if you, if, if you want to use that analogy? Um, how can we free ourselves to our, our higher humanity <clears throat> going into this future? I think there are a lot of lessons <clears throat> in uh, environmental sciences and ecology. Uh, you know, like I, I have a living shoreline that I gaze at sometimes. And a living shoreline is, um, is where you'll actually create, um, you'll create a revetment to keep um, 
keep the uh, the waves or the water from washing away or eroding the shore. But you have to have breaks in the revetments um, where the uh, where the tidal water can get in and out in order to cleanse the shoreline and avoid a buildup of stagnant water and bacteria that that kills everything. So you have to have continual circulation and you have to be in relationship with nature. We have this phrase, you know, it's not natural, right? Uh, and and uh, or it it is natural kind of means it's a good thing. It's unnatural means it's not necessarily a good thing. I think that um Zoo creatures will live longer in captivity, uh, but they end up becoming fat and blind and toothless, and they can't fend for themselves. They have to be fed. And over time, if you start to conclude that the healthy lion is the fat, toothless lion that has to be fed through a feeding tube, then you have a pretty distorted view of virtue, right? And um, so... So studying the lions in the zoo is probably not a good idea. And, uh, and if you decide to domesticate yourself, then the question becomes, who's your zookeeper? And when will they tire of you and stop feeding you through the tube and stop protecting you? And as soon as they stop, you're going to die. So the, the problem with all these systems, all the monetary systems, is we attempt to create these artificial systems you know, like the proof of stake systems, you're trying to create a system in software and you're just trusting some software engineers to make it, uh, to make it honest and virtuous. And as soon as one of them has a, a good idea and they keep having good ideas, they keep loading on idea after idea after idea. And you, you end up with this shark duck that lives in the trees idea that makes no sense, but because you've got an all-powerful being in you know in the ecosystem that gets to just go ahead and put a hundred and eighty-seven foot nose and thirty-seven antlers on the shark duck, and you can't stop it, you know, there's no feedback to point out that you know having a hundred and thirty-seven antlers on a shark duck makes it impossible to swim, right, or fly. So the way that you keep from creating those monstrosities is you subject yourself to natural rigor on a on a consistent basis right and and bitcoin it subjects itself to natural rigor because you have to generate sha 256 hashes and you have to generate them consistently with energy and you start breaking the rules you can't generate the hashes you know or if you fall behind and you have old antiquated equipment you can't afford to ge- to compete with the new modern equipment. So there's a never ending uh, replacement of the old generation with the new generation and the lazy incompetent is squeezed off the network by um, by the the younger, more aggressive. Right. And um, someone that uh, that loses their money because they lose their keys, they don't just get it back by appealing to authority, they lose it and it's a contribution of their energy to everybody else in the ecosystem. So Bitcoin is, is naturally engineered to be organically healthy in the same way that you know a creature in nature can't help but be healthy. It's, you can't regulate your body temperature at 37 degrees Fahrenheit for long before you simply just die, right? And it's like, it doesn't matter how much you wish you could, you just can't, right? And, and that's, that is the brutal discipline of nature. And the result is you have this feedback and then you have a constant Darwinian evolution uh, to the virtuous. And that's how life continues. So I think the recipe for virtue in a monetary system is you have to plug it into nature, right? Gold was plugged into nature in a roundabout way, not perfect because you could sort of sack a city and inflate the supply of gold or, you know, or you could find more gold and you can lie about the quality of the gold and you could centralize the gold and seize it, right? So not perfect, but, but there was some thermodynamic relationship, uh, to nature and matter and energy. And I think Bitcoin achieves that thermodynamic relationship via proof of work mining. And um, 
And that's what makes it healthy, the fact that it's, it's, it's an open protocol that's decentralized, you know, makes it, makes it uh, uncorruptible, you know, much, much, much harder to corrupt than something that does naturally centralize. And uh, so I, I do think it is like uh, it is like Arabic math. It is like a standard English language. It is like certain other protocols like TCP, IP and the like. It's a base level protocol to build a civilization, you know, and and uh, and and it is uh, a wonderful achievement. And just like just like we can't really expect to advance without mastering the flow of water or mechanics, uh, you know, or, or fire or electricity. We can't really expect to drive forward the socioeconomic political systems uh, of humanity without mastering money or monetary engineering. So I think one day... One day we will see a subject called monetary engineering that will be taught in engineering schools, you know, all around the world. And we'll know that we've succeeded when you have a choice of studying electrical engineering or nuclear engineering or aeronautical engineering or monetary engineering. And, uh, and when we put monetary engineers, you know, in charge of our systems instead of um, instead of just putting lawyers and politicians in charge of these things. Wonderfully said. Um, yeah, constant, continuous feedback, learning, honest work seems to be the path to individual and collective success in this world. Michael, thank you for your time, your eloquence, your skin in the game. Um, again, Sailor Series starts at episode one, the What Is Money show. This is on YouTube. And what is money podcast.com and the sailor series book is now available paperback hardback and kindle versions on amazon michael thank you again yeah thanks for doing this with me robert i really enjoyed it and i hope uh i hope people get some uh, value from this and 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 uh find ways that they can use it to uh inspire people around them or or improve their own lives and uh i look forward to any comments and feedback and until then onward and upward onward and upward thank you so much